Good morning, everyone. Today, I call the State and Local Government Finance and Policy Committee to order on Thursday, March 7th. There is a quorum present. Um, I would like to ask represent our Vice Chair Hewitt, have you had an opportunity to review the minutes? Madam Chair, I have and so moved. Okay. Is there any discussion to the March 5th minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor of adoption, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion prevails and the minutes of March 5th are adopted. Before us today, we have <laughs> Chair Nelson. It's so good to have you in state and local government. I will move House File 4339 to be, oh, we'll lay out the bill over, but the bill is now before the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, this bill is a, it's a fairly simple bill. It's brought to me by Hennepin County, and it's, it has to deal with their set aside construction projects. And what they're trying to do is, in, is, is a, tweak the, uh, the, 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 the response or the requirement that on this bill to allow construction companies doing business with the county to be able to um, use people that are in public assistance or probationers, get them into construction jobs. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mike here from the uh, county and he can explain the bill. If you please state your name for the record and begin your testimony, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, uh, my name is Michael Rosenfeld. Mm -hmm. I'm with Hennepin County. I manage the negotiated procurement within the county's contract, contracting and uh, procurement department. Um, this proposal is rooted in the county's desire to have an additional tool to promote hiring and on-the-job training for residents under court supervision, such as probationers, in county construction projects. The county wants to use its set-aside contracting authority with construction firms that agree to employ these residents as apprentices on county construction projects, where they will receive on-the-job training and have a career pathway into the building trades. What prevents the county from using the current Section 383B authority for this purpose is the requirement that the majority of the construction business's employees must be people who would require public assistance or rehabilitative services in the absence of the set-aside contract. We don't believe any construction business can meet that requirement. So this requirement has, while it, and it has been met by nonprofit social service organizations with whom the county has contracted, um, but it simply doesn't reflect, reflect the realities of construction firms, uh, the majority of whose employees are, have specialized training, uh, and depending on the nature of the work, they may be licensed in, the, in a particular trade. Uh, so what the bill does is it'll, it uh, creates a unique eligibility criteria for the county to set aside contracts with construction firms. And that criteria aligns with the objective of using some county construction projects as a, as a platform for probationers to be working and receiving on-the-job training. Uh, my colleague, Logan Futterer, manages the county's Community Productive Day program uh, within the county's corrections department. And Madam Chair, with your permission, Mr. Futterer can provide a brief description of how he manages that program and how that program works with the Carpenters Union and through journeyman carpenters to train probationers in basic carpentry skills. Uh, in closing, the county sought this legislation to enhance its ability to place more participants from Mr. Futterer's program within the workforce of the construction firms that are delivering county construction projects. And I would be happy to answer any questions from any members of the committee uh, now or after Mr. Futterer's remarks. Okay. If you'd like to come forward, that would be fine. Thank you for your testimony today. Thank you. If you would please state your name for the record and begin your testimony, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Logan Footer. I am the, as Michael said, I'm the Productive Day Program Manager at Hennepin County. Uh, the Productive Day Program is a paid employment training program for people supervised uh, by Hennepin County and they're on probation and parole. Um, we have a, a on-the-job uh, training program that where our participants are supervised and directed by, by five journeyman carpenters with a fifth day of classroom education that covers um, a, a wide range of topics, cognitive, cognitive skills training, financial uh, skills training, um, employment readiness, as well as uh, uh, union-developed uh, carpentry 
uh, curriculum. Um, this bill, currently our focus is, is mainly on rehabbing tax forfeited properties, so it's a lot of resident, residential work. Um, this bill would allow us to, to expand, to expose our participants to more commercial focused carpentry, which we, we don't have a lot of access to. Um, it would also expose them to working mm -hmm. alongside potential future employers, which our end goal being um, getting them into union employment um, and, and working with, with directly for these um, companies working on these county projects. We're also um, looking to expand uh, to, to potentially work with the laborers union as well moving forward. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Um, uh, Chair Nelson, is there anything more that you'd like to say before we ah. take it to discussion? Discussion's fine. Okay. And as um, members, do you have any questions, issues, concerns that you'd like to discuss? Seeing none, um, would you like to close the bill? Thank you, Madam Chair and members. And again, this is a, a program that, by tweaking this program, it allow, would allow these people to get into con good paying construction jobs. Um, one of the big drawbacks from people on rehabilitation or probation is getting a good job. And with a good job, they're not going to fall back into their past past problems. So that's what this bill does. It allows these construction companies, or it would allow these people to get into construction companies and construction work, and again, move on with their lives and better their lives. I'm sorry, uh, Chair Nelson, I did not see that there was an A1 amendment. Is that your amendment? Oh, yes, there's an A1. I'm sorry, I forgot the button. Yeah, there's an yeah. A1 amendment, and but it just basically adds to deliver to the set-aside contracts. So <coughs> it just... Just a little tweak to the. All right. Thank you for bringing that. So the A1 is before us. I, I move that the A1 be before us. Members, was there any discussion to the A1? All those in favor of adoption of the A1, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The bill is amended with the A1. Thank you. And then we will lay the bill over for future consideration. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Chair Nelson. Representative Kozlowski. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I will move House File 4193 uh, to be re referred to capital investment. The bill is now before us. Representative Kozlowski, if you'd like to tell us about your bill. Great. Thank you, Chair Cleborne and members. Buju, Ozawa Anakwad, Magizin and Dodame. Leish Kozlowski, uh, Jagamashimo. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present House File 4193. This is a bill that will um, rematriate the cloquet forestry through a land transfer of certain state-owned lands to the University of Minnesota to its original caretakers. Um, in 1909, the cloquet forestry center, which sits wholly within the Fond du Lac Band's tribal boundaries, was established on 2,000 acres, and it continued expanding until 2003, where it sits at its currently 3,400 acres. Um, this, the center is, as I mentioned, wholly and uniquely situated within the borders of the tribal community. And the center has been the primary research and education for the University of Minnesota. However, this land was originally reserved for the Fond du Lac Band under the 1854 Treaty of La Pointe. Um, at the request of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, our leaders um, alongside the university has been engaged in regular and ongoing dialogue um, for years over this cloquet forestry center. In 2020, the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council uh, followed suit, which represents uh, the governing body of 10 of 11 Minnesota's tribes, um, took action and passed a resolution asking for the return of the land. This bill before us today is one that is actually technical in nature due to its complex real estate process in that um, the cloquet forestry land has both university as well as some um, parcels that are owned by the state of Minnesota. And so the, the goal of this bill is really to get it into one package for that continued um, and eventual transfer. So section one is authorizing the Department of Administration to execute that title transfer to the regions of University of Minnesota um, to then transfer the Cloquet Forestry Center in its entirety to the band. Um, 
I'll let our testifiers tell you lots more and we'll get into the details and conversation, but I just wanna say this is a really good day and this is a really good another step forward um, in repairing and restoring and regenerating our homelands and our people. Um, but also it's good news for Minnesota because um, all that's going to change is a title deed and the band and the university and through a public process that um, has been robust will continue and actually strengthen and bolster um, the research that's been happening. There's a memorandum of understanding that's been reached um, and it's continuing to be worked out and details continue to go forward, but this is going to be good news um, and a win, win, win. So look forward to the continued dialogue um, questions and to go forward in a, in a good way. So I'll turn it over to our testifiers chair. Thank you, representative. And first on the list, we have Elise Roberts Davis, Vice President at the University of Minnesota Services. If you'd please state your name for the record and begin your testimony, Vice President. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. It is great to be back in state and local mm -hmm. government finance committee. I'm Alice Roberts Davis. I am Vice President for the University of Minnesota. Um, and thank you for the time to hear House File 4193 today. And thank you, Representative Koslowski, for carrying this bill. Very briefly, Section 1 of House File 4193 transfers title of ownership of certain parcels of land within the Cloquet Forestry Center from the state of Minnesota to the University of Minnesota. This action is necessary to enable a complete final transfer of land from the university to the Fond du Lac Band. House File 4193 moves us forward in the spirit of collaboration and partnership with the Fond du Lac Band and the university has, productive, has had productive discussions over the last several months to create a framework to continue delivering on our research, education, and outreach capacities at the Cloquet Forestry Center. We are also exploring additional opportunities to bring a crucial tribal perspective to help broaden understanding and experiences in forest resources. The Cloquet Forestry Center has been the primary research and education and outreach forest of the University of Minnesota since 1909, and the Department of Forest Resources has delivered educational and research programs there since 1903. The university's focus is on ensuring that our faculty, research professionals, and staff have the tools and resources they need to help them deliver on our research, education, and outreach mission. We are confident that this step forward will result in a richer and more fulfilling forest resources program, and we are so thankful for your time for hearing House File 4193 today. We're happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much for your testimony. And we have one more member of the public who has signed up to testify. If I could ask Rick Horton to come forward, please. Welcome to the committee. If you'll state your name for the record and please begin your testimony. My name is Rick Horton. I'm the Executive Vice President of Minnesota Forest Industries. Chair Cleborn and members, uh, in, as, as uh, Representative Kozlowski said, in 1896, just two years after the Hinckley fire, which you know burned up 12 communities, 350,000 acres and killed 418 people, Professor Samuel Green and members of the forest products industry realized that they needed to change. They needed to develop a conservation ethic and they needed a place where they could train future foresters and research how to heal the land. And so um, it took until about 1909 to uh, fully see this vision come to fruition and came about through the purchase of an initial 2,215 acres of unallotted tribal lands. Um, and then uh, from there they purchased other surrounding lands. Some of them were allotted tribal lands and those people were paired, paid fair market value. They were paid for the timber value on the land and they were offered other tracts to move to, to live on and they were willing sellers. Um, other lands were purchased from settlers and some were donated by other people. And this eventually came to be the 3,400 acres that we see now. And so now we've had uh, 115 years of research and training thousands of foresters. And as a result, we have the beautiful, sustainably managed forests that we have today in Minnesota. That was critical to doing so. And you know, here we are with the specter of climate change looming over us, and we need to continue to do research so that we can figure out how to help our forests 
help us with climate change. They currently absorb like 14% of all CO2 emissions in the state. Uh, you know, the forest product sector is the only carbon negative sector of the economy, and we can manage our forests better to absorb even more carbon and store it. So, um, you know, we're, we're asking that, uh, that this process be slowed down a little bit because while there's been a lot of communications between the university and the tribe, it has not been that transparent with us and with other stakeholders in the community, and that's led to a fair amount of distrust and concern moving forward. You know, the, the local citizens do use that property to recreate, and they're very concerned about the transfer. But for us, you know, we really want it to see it continue as is. And, you know, as Representative Kozlowski said, the, there's an MOU that's being developed, but it, we haven't seen it. There's been a complete lack of transparency through this whole process. And, um, you know, I think that the concerned citizens of the state should have a role in this process. Um, barring that, you know, we would like to remind you that the land was purchased. And if it's going to be transferred, we feel that it should be sold according to university policy and those funds used to um, pay for the development of a new facility like this. Because long-term goal is not to continue this as a research facility forever. Eventually it will transfer over. We're trying to work out the details of what we can do together, but um, again, we're not at the table and we have some deep concerns about it. So thank you for your interest. Thank you so much, Mr. Hartman, for your testimony. We appreciate hearing from you. <coughs> and I understand there is one other individual who would like to testify. Mr. If you please come forward. <coughs> Welcome to the committee. And if you'll state your name for the record and begin your testimony, please. Good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, Roger Smith, Sr. I am the District 3 representative uh, and vice chairman for Fond du Lac, Band of Lake Superior, Chippewa. And welcome, or uh, good morning, committee. Good morning. Please begin your testimony. Madam Chair and committee, we, we, we look back on, um, on how this land was transferred, how, how it was gotten by the university, and we can certainly focus on the negatives, on how that was. We, we heard that uh, talk about fair market value, and I don't think that's the case. When there's reports of paying $1.25 per acre, when the appraised value was ten eighty eight an acre. And the allottees are even getting even less. Fond du Lac was made up of the, the 1854 Treaty of La Pointe, where it had created 100,000 acres for the Fond du Lac Band. The forestry takes up 3,471 acres, which is roughly 3% of the land base. We look at the MOU um, that we have with the university, and we're very excited to work with the university, to finally work with the university on some very important research, and I'll get to that in a minute. But when we look at the MOU, and, and uh, within two weeks after we signed the MOU, we had a public hearing uh, that was very well attended. Um, and through this whole process um, and this administration at Fond du Lac, it's to make things transparent, not only to our band members, but for our community. Because we realize the, the use of the uh, Cloquet Forestry to the local area and the importance of the forestry of training future foresters. So when we look at the importance of ongoing and in, in this relationship with the University of Minnesota, Fond du Lac is very, very excited about this relationship. Because as we look at uh, our connection to the land, 
It is very important. That is who we are. That is part of our culture, that everything has a living being. And when we look at the trees and uh, even uh, the medicines that lie within the forestry, it is very important to the Fond du Lac people. So when we look at the ongoing research, the research that uh, has happened, and we are now uh, in a partnership with the university, we're very excited. If we look at the winter that we just had and the importance of that research on what it does to, to the trees, just in itself, maple sugar trees, which is a very important staple to the Anishinaabe. And to have that research of how does that affect it on winters like we just have. So when we look at our connectedness to the land, uh, to the uh, trees, we're very excited about this. And when we look at uh, the ongoing research, that is something that we want to be part of, uh, to have that relationship with the university. And, and quite frankly, we're very excited. We look at our forestry department. Now, I started my young career as a forestry aide and working with um, our small forestry department at, in the beginning. And our foresters are very excited to get to work with the foresters at the university. Because of what it will do is make a healthy forest, not only in the forestry, but throughout Fond du Lac. And I think the research that comes out of that actually makes a healthy forest for the state of Minnesota. Thank you for your testimony. We appreciate hearing from you. And I just want to acknowledge uh, the Fond du Lac Band as a sovereign nation and uh, your, your right and ability to enter into a memorandums of understanding. So uh, I just want to put that on the table as well. So thank you very much for your testimony. Um, I want to make sure we have time to take a vote on um, as we go forward and we have time for test, uh, conversation. Okay. Um, <coughs> Next, we will move on. I don't see any amendments to the bill, is that correct? Okay. Um, next, we'll move on to discussion of the members. Is there any discussion? Um, Representative Nash, you have uh, Representative Joy as well. Representative Joy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Klo uh, Representative Kowalski, for this. A um, couple questions. I, we hear memorandum of understanding. And, you know, as a legislator and a, and a lawmaker, one of the things I like to see is the the memorandum of understanding, so I understand how it's all gonna look if we make these decisions. And I, I'm kinda surprised that we don't have that in here so we could have looked at that and had the research of what the language is gonna look like. You know, because when we're transferring land like this, and granted, we don't have a fiscal note on this yet, which I think is important to have, but when we're transferring land like this and we're trying to make a decision of how this is gonna look in the future, I would have liked to have seen a memorandum of understanding so I could have said that. You know, the University of Minnesota is intent to continue the relationship or whatever, 50 years, 100 years, whatever, and continue this process, and this is how this is going to look. Yeah. Now we're kind of sitting here in the dark not knowing what that's going to look like if we make a decision moving forward with this. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Nadeau. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Kozlowski. Um, I am... I am pretty much in support of this, uh, this legislation. I do have a question. I have two questions. First, can you talk, and, and maybe this is University of Minnesota too. Um, I'm probably one of the few people that actually went to Cloquet Forestry Center. Um, I studied forest ecology at the University of Minnesota, and um, I have fond, fond memories of, of being up there studying silviculture, actually. So um, what is the plan in the MOU? Um, is the Fond du Lac tribe going to continue to have the, that forestry research center and history center up there for the duration? Is that, is that the intent, or is it planned to be phased out at some time? Representative Kozlowski. Sure, and, and thank you so much, both of you um, representatives, for, for the questions. And in terms of 
the memorandum of understanding of the long-term plans, you know, obviously the U is here, I'll, I'll let them speak best to those conversations and future looking. Um, I will say that the next step to the point of fiscal note is going to the bonding committee. There is, I believe um, we have folks who could speak to that too, but there is um, a defeasant that needs to be paid out with the bond. And as I understand, that's in, in the range of about a million dollars. But when you, as chair, Chairman uh, Smith talked about, that's pretty statistically insignificant when you think about the funds that were acquired. And I would just also encourage our members to check out the truth report, which is over a 500 page document that was done in cooperation with the Minnesota Indian Affairs Council, the university, um, and many other partners that detailed the process and outlines of how this land was acquired through government um, policies and, and things that were enacted to erase and forcibly remove and then acquire this land at much lower than market value. Um, for example, that report talks about how Dakota tribes were paid two cents per acre as well. The university sold, turned around and sold that for over 250 times the amount. Um, we have a permanent university fund that is also managed by our state of DNR um, that in three years uh, acquired off of the mineral rights from this land that was taken over $20 million and, and has amassed over $500 million. And so I just encourage us to have a really firm understanding and we can talk about agreements and as you mentioned, tribal nations have the ability and the um, authority to, to do that and enact their tribal sovereignty, but to really understand what we're talking about here um, and how this came to be. But I'll, I'll, Chair, if I could turn it over to the U to talk okay. about the MOU. And if we can just keep the conversation concise, that would be great. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Representative Nadeau. I think that um, your question is a very good one, and this is actually what we believe is right in line with the mission of the university. We want to ensure that we have ongoing um, research and education and outreach um, for the university through the Cloquet Forestry Center and having that tribal perspective is very important for us to continue that. And so the, the goal now is to continue on in a partnership with the, um, with the Fond du Lac Band in the Cloquet Forestry Center research. Thank you very much. And Representative Nando, a follow-up? And, and just my follow-up question is, why is the University of Minnesota um, and, and, and the tribes, as they're going through this private, I mean, I know that this bill just transfers the title um, to the University of Minnesota from the state. Um, why, should, why should the state, this is a massive asset that has a lot of value. And I know I've heard that it's around a million dollars to defease, you know, and prepay, you know, whatever debt. That, why should the state, why should, this, why should we be covering that expense? Why, why, is that not, um, why is that not being covered by the university and or through the transfer itself? Um, Vice President. Um, Madam Chair, uh, Representative, uh, again, this is all a collaborative uh, work that we're trying to do together. We're working collaboratively with the state, the university, the tribe to make sure that we're just returning the property so that we can all work on the long-term um, research that's happening there and each, each individual agency is doing its part. Thank you. Uh, Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, my side of the aisle took care of all my questions, so um, I'm, I'm just concerned with uh, the lack of a fiscal note. Uh, we've talked about that again and again and again, and line 2.11 is an ellipsis. I, I don't have a box of dots, but... It's unfortunate I like dots. I have one in my office. I could run and get it, but <laughs> I, I just... Process matters, Madam Chair. And, Process, process will never stop mattering. So thank you. Thank you. And as I said uh, at the very beginning, this is going to be re-referred to capital investment, and they will be the committee responsible for the financial piece of this bill. Um, Representative, are, are there any other questions or concerns? Okay, seeing none, Representative Kozlowski, if you would like to um, close up your bill, and then I'll, re I'll make a motion to re-refer. Great. Uh, thank you, members, for uh, this conversation and questions. And as we move forward to the bonding committee, um, look forward to engaging in the dialogue. Um, I'll just end by saying that, uh, again, we're very excited to continue these conversations and this process. And as 
at the band as, as Anishinaabeg people, you know, we, we use the word Bizendawiyeg. And to the, the conversation that's been happening, we're not just looking out for our people, though this has left a, a hole that's felt and noticed in our tribal homelands that will restore our people, restore the land. But we are also taking care of each other in this place and our future seven generations. So thank you again for the opportunity. And, um, appreciate your support in referring this to bonding. Thank you. Thank you, and with that, I will renew my motion that House File, <laughs> sorry about that, uh, House File 4193 be re-referred to Capital Investments. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Yeah. No, no. Okay. The motion prevails, and House File 4193 is re-referred to Capital Investments. Next, we have House File 4310. Representative, our Chair Lilly, <laughs> welcome to the committee. It's good to have you with us this morning. I will move that House File 4310 be re-referred to Ways and Means. The bill is now before us. If you would talk about your bill. Thank you, uh, Chair Cleborn and uh, members and uh, star staff. I'm a little bit jealous seeing uh, Miss Roberts there. Uh, <laughs> she ditched us in legacy, so uh, you just don't know how lucky you are. Oh, yes, we do. Yes, we do. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So House File, uh, <laughs> she's going to not be happy with me probably, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, House File uh, 4310 is a compensation plans uh, bill that was ratified through the subcommittee of uh, employee relations. And the bill uh, essentially is uh, a bunch of plans, and I'll kind of just go through them, but then I have some real experts here with me. Um, the commissioner's plan, managerial plan, the office of higher education, unclassified personnel compensation plan, Mincher compensation plan, and uh, also the 20, uh, 24 and 25 Minnesota State Administrator personnel plan. Uh, the plans that were negotiated through uh, MMB cover about uh, uh, 20, 2,960 employees and the plan submitted through uh, Minnesota State. Um, our school system uh, covers about 500 administrator. I have uh, um, Nick with me here, and uh, he can go into the bill with uh, more detail. And then we have uh, quite a bit of talent out there in the crowd, way in the back there. So if there's any questions uh, that Mr. Nash or his team has or others, um, we're looking forward to that. So if you're uh, William, Madam Chair, uh, would like to have Nick uh, kind of take over. Thank you. Welcome to the committee. If you'll state your name for the record and begin your testimony, please. Thank you, Chair Cleveborn uh, and members. I'm Nick Nigro with the Legislative Coordinated Commission, uh, and our office provides staff support for the Subcommittee on Employee Relations. Um, included in your meeting materials is a summary of the plans that are ratified uh, by this bill. Uh, there are more detailed summaries and the plans themselves online at the SER's website. Uh, a high level overview um, is that among these five plans, the first four are negotiated through MMB, um, and those plans are uh, largely similar uh, in that uh, each have a 5.5% increase in salaries effective last, Jan last July and a 4.5% uh, effective July of this year. Um, they also include annual merit-based increases, uh, generally at 3.5%, um, and on average about half of the covered employees are eligible. Um, so these plans do not uh, add to the uh, biennial base, um, but they will take out of the uh, operating costs currently. Um, for MMB, that's about $69 million. Um, that's a 7.68% increase um, and an average of a 10.16% increase from the 24-25 biennium to the 26-27 biennium. Um, and the insurance benefits, uh, which include dental health disability, are initially bargained, um, and those are generally consistent across the plans. Uh, and then there is one plan uh, that covers uh, Minnesota State Colleges and Universities, um, and that has a 2.5% increase um, July 1st of last year, uh, and again this year. Um, and that also has a merit-based increased pool. Uh, 
and that will add uh, 14 million uh, to their uh, biennium costs. Um, and that's a 6.82% increase. Um, and that's a 9.33% increase from the 24-25 biennium to the 26-27 biennium. Um, attached uh, is a settlement sheet showing all of these estimated costs um, by MMB and Minnesota State um, alongside the uh, negotiated collective bargaining agreements. Um, and th those estimates indic indicate increased costs um, of all of them will be 7.75% uh, in this biennium with an impact of 10.53% on the next biennium. Uh, Madam Chair and members, uh, that concludes my overview. I'm happy to answer uh, any questions and I know uh, our friends from MMB are here if uh, you have particularly technical questions. Thank you. Thank you, and I would just like to take a moment to thank you and the Legislative Coordinating Commission for the great nonpartisan work that you do in helping us get these um, budgets and plans uh, moving forward, so thank you. Um, any questions from the members? Representative Harder. Thank you, Chair Cleborn. Uh, when I was at the county, we had union negotiations, and sometimes they were simple. And sometimes they were difficult. And usually when there's a negotiations, the unions will come to the table with a list of wants and needs. And uh, sometimes uh, they are fulfilled and sometimes they are not. And I'm just curious if there was anything during these negotiations that they came with a list of uh, wants that ended up being compromised. I'm just curious if there was anything like that. I believe we're uh, trying to dial a friend. I think Chairman uh, Director Weber is going to address this. Madam Chair, I'm Michelle Yurek with the Legislative Coordinating Commission. I got married last summer, so the new name. But, oh my gosh, forgive um, me. <laughs> and uh, Representative Harder, these are the compensation plans that are not collectively bargained, so they are not uh, union covered employees. So these are the plans, um, but MMB could if you have questions specifically about if there was anything that they um, considered in the plans, MMB could cons could bring that. But that it wasn't a collectively bargained agreement. Thank you very much. And I think it's important to know that the Subcommittee on Employee Relations is a nonpartisan committee. I mean, it's a bipartisan committee. So, uh, and these, I understand, uh, went through with unanimous consent. Is, is that correct? I believe we had some dissenting votes. Oh, there were some dissenting votes, all right. Well, then I stand corrected, as I often do. Okay, uh, did you have a follow-up? Thank you. Uh, thank you for the information, because uh, things are done differently than what I'm used to, so thank you very much for that clarification. Yep. Thank you so much. Any other questions? Uh, Representative Nadeau. Just one really fast question. Um, is, do these, kind of match similarly with the collective bargaining that was done within those within those agencies um, my again my experience is only with you know county and we have unrepresented people as well and so we would negotiate with the collective bargaining and then those unrepresentative that those unrepresented populations would very closely match what was what was bargained for is that the case here as well um, chair Lilly Thank you, uh, Chair uh, Cleborn and uh, Representative Nadeau. Um, it is my understanding that uh, there is quite a few parallels that were similar to the, you know, like, say, like the MAPE contract or the Ask Me with the, you know, the, the majority of uh, public uh, uh, employees. But uh, I'm going to pass to uh, Chair Cleborn, uh, Representative Nadeau. Uh, there are obviously technical uh, differences between the collective bargaining agreements and these compensation plans. Um, but if you turn towards the uh, salary settlement uh, at the back of my summary, um, you'll see that the across the board increases um, in 23 and 24 um, are the same uh, for both uh, the collective bargaining agreements um, and then also the uh, MMB negotiated agreements. Thank you. Representative Nadeau? Okay, thank you very much. It's a good question. Any other questions? Lead Nash. Thank you, Madam Chair, and to the author. Um, how, so you've got an increase of 7.69 and 
for the 2627 base a 10.41 how does that how how does that impact what everyone has been talking about which is the uh, some call it a structural imbalance my side would call it a structural deficit can you help us uh, work through that uh, Lead Nash I'd just like to remind you the numbers are on the back side of our uh, handout and they're just a little different from the numbers that you put forward but if you would be willing to answer the question please um, thank you uh, uh, chair and uh, uh, Lead Nash um, so the the contracts are um, on the front end are baked in to to be absorbed into into the uh, you know the budgets that we passed so essentially you know going forward but then in the future yes there will be uh, uh, additional uh, uh, expense or or you know to cover our amazing talent that we have in the state that uh, <laughs> no but I mean we'll have to be realistic about uh, changing the budgets because it it is uh, and that's time you know you have to factor that in with every pay raise Reed Nash is there for the question thank you madam chair and, and irrespective of what numbers may be uh, the yeah. chair himself just acknowledged that we're looking at a, a structural deficit and the walls administration has pointed that out in the different briefings um, economists are talking about it the chair has talked about it now um, uh, decisions that we make here have to be considered and I, I think that um, we need to look at every nickel we spend moving forward this year of the biennium with that in mind because um, money only comes from one place um, and that is the taxpayer so thank you thank you very much and um, is there any further discussion would you like to close up the bill uh, Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, members, for uh, looking at this. And uh, um, I think it is important to, uh, you know, to uh, we're seeing this with employee. I was on Ways and Means yesterday, and we're seeing that uh, retaining staff and having employees in Minnesota is a, is a is an important factor. And unemployment is very low, and we need to make sure that we're retaining our talent. And we are one of the best-run states in the country. And uh, and uh, you know this. These plans cover our college system. I mean, how important is that for Minnesota? You know, the, the it is managers, but they're also part of the team that's making sure that our future is bright. And there's other many other plans in here, so I shouldn't just focus on just that. But um, I think the future is. Uh, I think in any business, you know that if you do raises, you know that your uh, in increases that that's going to be factored in and and you need to plan for that. So I think we are as a state, and I think we're in good shape, and I look forward to your support, please. Thank you very much. And with that, I will renew my motion that House File 4310 be re-referred to Ways and Means. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. The motion <laughs> prevails, and House File 4310 is re-referred to Ways and Means. Thank um, you, Madam Chair members. We have um, a need to take a five minutes or so uh, recess as the next bill um, author is also presenting in another committee. So while we wait for re the representative to arrive, we'll just be in recess. We expect it to be five minutes or so. Thank you. We are currently in recess.
I will call the State and Local Government Finance and <coughs> Policy Committee back to order. And with that, I will move that House File 3938 be before the committee. And I understand that you have a DE1. Would you like to? Uh, welcome to the committee, Representative Curran. It's good to see you. Thank you, Chair. Yes, if you would like to maybe tell us about the bill and then uh, discuss the DE1. Thank you. Um, sure. Um, so I, the, if, uh, could we maybe move the bill first? Mm -hmm. Would that be okay? Yes, I will move, move House the, File. Oh, sorry, move the DE That's first. fine. I will move House File 3938 to be re-referred to the Health Committee. The bill is before us. Okay. Um, sorry, I meant move the DE first. Uh, I thought I already had done that. So okay. All right. I will move the DE be before okay. us for discussion. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so this DE is just technical assistance um, to put the language in the correct sections. Um, so it's essentially uh, same language, but just restructured a, a little bit. And so I'd ask that members um, uh, vote in favor of the DE. Okay. Um, so the the uh, normal custom is to have the bill in the order that the author would like to have it in. Yes. So, uh, members, is there any discussion to the DE1? Seeing none, all those in favor of the DE1, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion prevails, and House File 3938 is amended with the DE1. Your bill as amended is now before us. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you uh, so much, committee members. Uh, in front of us today, we have House File 3938 amended. Um, this bill is brought forward by ARM, which is the st Statewide Trade Association of Residential Service Providers Supporting People with Disabilities. Uh, this bill would exempt group homes, uh, specifically licensed under Minnesota Statute 245A, from being regulated under a city, town, or county's uh, rental regulations. I will note that this does have uh, bipartisan support in the Senate as well. Um, the need for this bill came from a growing trend of cities using their local rental regulations to keep group homes from coming into their cities or forcing them out of neighborhoods. Um, and before I move on, I just wanted to address uh, some of the oppositional letters that have been received by the committee and posted to the public. Um, I'll refer to a letter from Metro Cities. Um, and you know, while I, while I appreciate um, that there's intention to protect the safety of residents in the community, um, I just wanna point out that over the years, there's been a shift in uh, how we operate in this space. Um, when we implemented the positive supports rule uh, accompanying 245D licensing regulations years ago, um, you know, we, we went from this place in the past where people had a tendency to wanna put folks with disabilities in a bubble and protect people from everything. Um, which, you know, we understand that when someone's vulnerable, we need to take extra caution to ensure the person, uh, you know, isn't in risky situations. However, um, there, there is something uh, that exists that's called dignity of risk. And uh, we need to think about uh, when we, um, for our own comfort, are afraid to let someone who's vulnerable experience the world just as any of us. Um, that's out of our own fear, oftentimes. Um, and we need to uh, have people live as full life as possible. Now, that doesn't mean that we're exposing people uh, to danger intentionally. What it means is that um, we need to sort of uh, let go sometimes when we feel uncomfortable uh, where someone else is in a space that actually might be just fine for them. Um, and so there's, there's been that shift. Uh, and so, like I said, I, I understand and respect uh, the desire to want to provide extra protection for people. Um, but I think that's actually, uh, that's actually a misplaced feeling. And it, at, at this point in the disabilities field, that's an antiquated uh, mindset. Um, you know, and I've heard concerns too where um, people might have concerns with the staff at these locations. Um, and I would say staff of any employer, group home, Target, wherever, if that employee is not acting in accordance with the policies of that employer, they have to face employer consequences. They face workforce consequences. Uh, should that employee break the law while they're working at the group home or at Target, they face criminal charges. Um, and further, I would say that if uh, employees are engaging in activities that are, are seriously egregious, um, criminal activities uh, or violate vulnerable adult law, they very well might lose their ability to work in the field forever. 
um, depending on the severity of, of their action. So I just want to make it clear that we have um, these other mechanisms in place um, that work very well, that are uh, close to the people who are living in the program, close to the people who are working in these programs. Um, and so, you know, when we talk about a, a, a city rental license um, in the world of disabilities, uh, the city rental license is sort of this, um, this small thing over here on the floor, like, like it's there, but you don't really, you don't pay much attention to it because there's all of these other mechanisms in place. Um, and I would say too that just like anyone else in a community, we all, um, we all utilize public safety in the way that we need to keep us safe. Um, for medical emergencies. Um, if I'm someone who has a condition that requires an uh, unfortunate amount of ambulance visits to my house, I'm not gonna be evicted because of that um, because I don't have a rental you know, license imposed on me. Um, now, if someone in a residential facility um, ha is, ha is subject to an ordinance um, and is considered a nuisance for too many ambulance calls, they might very well lose their home on top of already being a medical fra medically fragile person. So I just wanna you know, sort of lay the foundation of what we're actually talking about here. Um, and certainly not uh, to disparage um, the intent of, of what cities are trying to do here. Um, and I just wanna note too on the, the letter, the latest letter from the League of Minnesota Cities, um, Again, I, I appreciate uh, the intent to ensure habitability and livability standards, mm -hmm. um, but there, uh, there is a 13 page uh, document that the state uses with, um, I've lost count of how many check boxes that have to be gone through. Um, uh, in, and this is well, well, well beyond what any city would inspect um, at any property. Um, and I, I am a bit concerned, honestly, with um, one section of the league's letter uh, that says um, through rental licensure, cities are often able to respond more quickly to address issues and concerns um, regarding the residents' livability, safety, and conditions of their housing. Um, I'm concerned because that's actually uh, pointing folks in the wrong direction for the correct assistance that they need. Um, and I just, I'm, I'm saying this in each committee that this bill goes to that, um, whenever somebody is concerned about the treatment of someone with disabilities, the appropriate place to contact is the Minnesota Adult Abuse Reporting Center, or as we call it in the field, the MARC. Um, there is, this is a, a call center, this is their sole purpose, uh, to receive these complaints um, and to investigate them promptly and thoroughly. Um, so again, I, I appreciate that uh, cities, you know, want to be close to this issue. Um, but to say that, you know, to respond more quickly um, is simply not accurate and it's actually not the, it, it's not the right mechanism to be using. Um, we, we have to be using MARC for these reports that are concerns of resident safety. Um, and I guess with that, um, I can turn it over to our testifier for more details. Thank you, Representative. And with us today, we have Sarah Grofstrom. Thank you very much. If you'll state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Good morning, <clears throat> excuse me. Good morning, Madam Chair and committee members for the record. My name is Sarah Grafstrom. I'm the Senior Director of State and Federal Policy with ARM, um, which as Representative Curran said, is a trade association of disability service providers. Minnesota is having a long overdue conversation about the importance of everyone having a place to call home. House File 3938 seeks to address an emerging issue with state law that threatens the constitutionally protected right to live independent, independently and in neighborhood of their choosing for people with disabilities. In recent months, we have seen news stories about cities revoking municipal rental licenses for various reasons, often ranging from neighborhood nuisance to overuse of emergency services. By revoking rental licenses, cities are de facto vetoing DHS's licensure process by telling the group home they cannot operate and repealing the rights of the people with disabilities living there by forcing them to find somewhere else to live. We've also heard troubling public comments from local elected officials with one city council member suggesting Minnesota should go back to the long gone era of non-residential settings and to quote, realize that not everyone can live next door in a residential setting. We have heard proponents claim to need rental licenses to protect the residents living in the homes. Thorough and extensive licensing regulations with the Department of Human Services are already in place with group homes throughout the state. 
making them some of the most well-maintained care settings available to Minnesotans who need them. In fact, many cities look at the state regulations that are already in place specific to group homes and use that as reasoning to carve out group homes from their residential rental licensing ordinance. By exempting residential programs in permitted single family houses from municipal rental licensing regulations, we are helping to ensure that people with disabilities have the right and choice to live in whatever community they choose, get rid of a confusing patchwork of regulations which differ city by city, and retain the safety and quality standards which are already imposed by the Department of Human Services. Madam Chair, thank you again for the time this morning and happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. And we have one other testifier listed, Josh Berg. When you're ready, if you'll state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, for the record, my name is Josh Berg and I am here today in full support of this bill. Uh, I am a passionate uh, advocate for individuals with disabilities and older adults and I've been concerned about this specific issue for almost a decade. And I'm finally uh, happy to see that this is finally getting addressed uh, here uh, this session. I'm a leader at a St. Paul based nonprofit affordable accessible housing provider and I'm an armed board member. I am also in my 10th year as a city council member from the city of Elko Newmarket an active member of the League of Minnesota Cities and was appointed to the Metro Cities Board of Directors in 2021. As a local elected official, I am supposed to be up here reinforcing the idea that local control is the only way to go. That local control is critical to, the livability, to ensuring the livability and safety standards for our communities. And that rental housing ordinances are supposed to allow cities to quickly respond to and address issues that are, in theory, designed to protect the safety of residents and the community. The simple fact of the matter is, though, there are robust state, county, and fire code oversight mechanisms already in place to address these issues. In fact, through these state licenses that these homes maintained, we are held to standards that often go far beyond what any rental license would ever require or protect against. Local control in this case does not add anything besides an opportunity for local governments to continue to discriminate against individuals with disabilities. Thankfully, many, many cities already exempt this from the rental licensing ordinances if they do actually have one. I spoke to several council members and staff from the cities in the metro and around the state, and the resounding theme was why would we waste valuable city resources to duplicate something another government entity is already doing? One council member from a large metro city stated it perfectly. Most of the exemptions in our rental licensing ordinance were derived in whole or in part from other metro area city ordinances that we reviewed. State statutes allow supportive housing of six units or less in any zone and we are careful not to approve ordinances or policies that infringe upon that. Regarding other facilities that are licensed through the state, because the state is inspecting those facilities, we did not want our ordinance to be duplicative of state requirements. This is also the case for this, those cities represented on the League of Minnesota Cities and Metro Cities Boards of Directors. Uh, as those cities with rental light housing ordinances, over 70% explicitly exempt state license settings like this. The problem, uh, Madam Chair and members, is that most cities in Minnesota have no idea what we are doing in this area. I've now reviewed over 100 plus city ordinances and have found that there is essentially no consistency whatsoever as it relates to how, when, or if cities write and enforce rental housing ordinances. In fact, there is such outdated language in some of the ordinances in some of the cities that you all represent that it's actually kind of embarrassing we haven't been talking about this sooner. It appears many cities think it is appropriate to treat an individual with disabilities different than the rest of the residents in our communities. For example, most cities explicitly allow a state licensed home to, that serves primarily older adults to not obtain a rental license, but the same state licensed facility that serves folks under a certain age that are uh, with disabilities, they're required to. Whether we at the local level like it or not, we need guidance. This is where local control turns into a statewide issue and this bill will take one small but important step to correct. For the past decade, as I mentioned, I've been working to remove these NIMBY driven policies and practices that prevent our fellow Minnesotans, those with disabilities, from living in communities they choose. Unfortunately, communities continue to find creative ways to use local control to limit where individuals with disabilities are allowed to live. I would like to just leave you with one last comment. I know many of you are aware of the work being done to help keep folks out of hospitals. This specific issue has been brought up at the Acute Care Transitions Advisory Council, I chair, I co-chair that council, uh, and in discussions with DHS as one of the several significant barriers to finding housing and supports for individuals stuck in hospitals. 
These discriminatory local ordinances are one of the many reasons why individuals cannot find housing outside of the acute care settings that they are stuck in. Providers across the state who are in one of the cities that do require rental housing ordinances are often afraid to accept individuals with complex care needs, forget about the mental health uh, and behavioral care challenges that some individuals might have because they fear the city could arbitrarily and capriciously revoke that license or permit based on any number of reasons. Let's finally take one step forward to give individuals with disabilities the option to live where they want to live and not allow discriminatory and unfair housing practices to persist in our communities any longer. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, is there anyone else in the public who wishes to testify on this bill? All right, seeing none, we'll go to member questions. And I, Representative Nadeau. Thank you, Representative Curran. I am supporting your bill with reservations today. I, I, think, it's, I think you point out some incredible things, um, and we're trying to tackle an issue that's really difficult. Um, a lot of people don't understand the complexity and the partnerships that are required. DHS licenses the services in these facilities. Local units of government are supposed to, you know, kind of work on the safety, health, and welfare of the facilities, but they also have a real role in, you know, responding to emergencies, dealing with the, with the neighbors and trying to be that partner. Um, I, I worry a little bit that we're, we're, we're kind of, um, we're kind of legislating on the margin. I mean, I, as far as I can, as I know, there's only one real issue that's ever resulted in somebody being displaced. And honestly, for me, that's one too many. The, this is a population that's super vulnerable. Um, they need to have these group homes. And there was, an, there was evictions that happened. And it was a short period of time, like 30 or 45 days. That's not OK. Um, I'm supporting this and hoping that you're gonna to continue to work on it. I think we need model ordinances that we can work with Metro cities or other people to try to create that space that, that recognizes that the state legislature, agree or disagree, we've decided that that is a permitted use in residential areas and we should, you know, and that's a good thing. Um, and it's gonna help those people um, integrate within the community, which is what we also want to happen. Um, but this one, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm going to vote for it today, um, but I hope that you'll keep working on that and recognizing that in many, many cases, and I know that the testifier alluded to in some instances there's some bad actors out there that, that, that might not want, um, you, you know, populations like this living in their community, and I think that's super unfortunate, and we need to do some real work to educate those people, but I think in a, as a whole, um, that's, not, that's not the huge issue um, but it's finding that balance between those partners. And local gov is an important partner in making sure that they, they have to look a little bit broader than just that one group home um, or two or three in their community. They've got a, a larger constituency. So I'm hoping that we can continue to work on this and bring metro cities and, and we can find a, a, little bit, uh, a little bit of space. So thank you for bringing it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Nadeau. Representative Bonner. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Representative Curran. Uh, you know, I, I really do appreciate you bringing this forward. Um, you know, I, I will be honest, uh, obviously in my role as the Vice Chair of the Human Services Committee, I know that owning and operating a group home is, is a very rigorous process. Um, it is not something that happens lightly. There is a lot of rules, regulations, and, and oversight into that to ensure that these vulnerable adults are in a safe position. And so I, I appreciate that. And, and I'm also um, a family member of an individual with um, some severe disabilities. And so uh, the exact clientele who would be in a group home. So I really appreciate and understand that. Now, if I'm not mistaken, my city, Maple Grove, um, does actually have an exemption for these types of facilities, um, which I'm delighted by. Um, and my question, I guess, is a little bit around this. And and then maybe a quick follow-up, but I understand that a lot of cities already have in place exemptions for these type of facilities. So I'm just trying to get sort of a handle on the scope of what we're doing here. Um, can you tell me about how many cities already have this exemption? I think you might have alluded to it, but could you refresh my memory? Yep. Uh, Josh Berg? Uh, like thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Bonner. Yes, uh, and, and the tricky part is there is no centralized location where all this information is had. So you have to go through city ordinance by city ordinance and pick apart which section of ordinance it might be in. Um, but if we just look at this committee, I was able to look into it this last week. Um, 
over 88% of the cities you all represent. And now there are some districts that have a ton of littler cities that I didn't dive into the details of all of those. Most of them don't have a rental licensing ordinance anyway. Um, but over 88% of the cities you all represent exempt these types of settings or similar settings that are state licensed only or don't have an ordinance in place at all. Um, and that's been the broad theme that I've been able to look at in the over 100 that I've looked at so far. So. Thank you very much. Representative, did you want to say anything further? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I was going to point out the same information as Mr. Berg, but <clears throat> um, to further uh, add to that, that considering that the large majority of cities represented here today in this committee are already providing the exemption, I think uh, the, the takeaway from that is this is the right thing to do. Um, and so we've still got uh, you know, a, a decent percentage of cities that are not consistent with the rest of the state. And so providing that consistency is what we're looking for across the state. Um, so that folks, when they're looking for their home, aren't gonna have to be worried about if ordinances are gonna allow them to live there or not. So um, I would say this, this provides uh, consistency and uh, will get us um, to the place that we need to be where everyone's protected. Okay, um, did you have a follow up? Or I just want to say briefly, I, I thank you for that information, the 88%. First of all, that's encouraging uh, to know that and to appreciate that this bill kind of helps us close the gap and standardize that um, across the state. Um, and I will just leave with this. You know, I, I, I can tell you in my neighborhood, I have um, a couple children with disabilities um, in, in the neighborhood, um, including a, a really lovely family who has a daughter with severe disabilities down the road. And it strikes me as odd that we would not want individuals, vulnerable individuals living in a group home to have the same rights, privileges, and abilities as this lovely family that lives down the way from me. And, and I, I would hate to see that happen. And so mm -hmm. I really appreciate this bill. I appreciate you bringing it forward um, and, and shining a light on, on how we could do better. Thank you. All right. Um, I don't see any further questions. Leave Nash. Any I will renew my motion that House File 30, did you wanna have any closing comments? Okay. I'll renew my motion that House File 38, as amended, be re-referred to the Health, Finance, and Policy Committee. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion prevails and you're on your way to health finance. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And with that, that concludes the business that we have before us today. Our next meeting will be Tuesday, March 12th. Thank you members for a great meeting and we are adjourned.